Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. This is video number 88 in my journey from kidney failure to kidney great and day two of Kidney Health Week here on Dadvice TV, where we are going live every single day with lots of great content all week long to help you focus on kidney health and to really shine a spotlight on the power of nutrition when it comes to living a wonderful life with chronic kidney disease. Now, I wanna go over real quick the upcoming schedule. Let me prop that up here. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, I was so ready and now I don't know where in the world I put it. Oh, well, I will find it in a little bit. All week though, there is stuff coming up. Um, I have nephrologists two different days who are coming on here to talk to us. One of them, oh, you guys are gonna love him. He's on tomorrow night at 7 p.m. So an hour later than I normally broadcast. We also have some other doctors and other people um, later in the week that are earlier at two o'clock. But if you go to dadvicetv.com, right on the homepage, just scroll down just a little bit, about that much, and you will see the schedule of everything that's coming this week. And I hope you guys can make the live shows because I love seeing all these great comments. Woohoo! there we go, look at that. And thank you so much for letting us know where you guys are from. I love seeing all the different places. And there's so many people that are not that far from me. Hey, I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio, just right down there in the bottom corner. Love it when there's local people. All right, so if you are new here, because we keep getting lots of new people, make sure and subscribe. It's completely free, doesn't cost you anything. And I love seeing that number get bigger and bigger. And most importantly, every time I upload some new content, you will get a notification. So you can come out here, check it out. And I'm living the kidney dream. I was diagnosed stage five and told I had zero chance, that's the exact word, zero chance of getting better, that GFR 13 was the best it would be, and that I needed dialysis. And if I didn't go on dialysis, well, in 45 days, I'd be six feet under. That is depressing. But I worked with doctors, I worked with nutritionists, I worked my butt off, and I learned that that was not the only solution. Today, GFR 33 plus, I don't know how much plus, but I was 33 the last time I checked it and I feel even better. I have zero symptoms, all of this from diet and nutrition. Now with us today, I have someone who's been here before, the author of Cooking for Your Kidneys, a great cookbook for kidney patients. Not only has it got recipes in it, but he explains the science behind um, how you cook the meals, and also a lot of great substitutions, a lot of great information here. You guys can get this book on Amazon. He suffered kidney failure, went on dialysis, and then got a transplant. On top of that, and being an author, he um, won an award, and I can't remember what it was called. I'm gonna bring him on real quick, hold on. I just rearranged my screen, I gotta find all my buttons. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, John. Hey, John, how you doing? Hi, James. Good, how it are was, you? Hey, doing great. It was the Kidney X Award. Is that correct? Right. Uh, for Kidney X is an organization um, put together by a couple different groups, including the American uh, Nef Society of Nephrologists, uh, and they were doing a patient innovation uh, program and also a couple other programs. And they recognized myself and about nine others uh, in the Patient Innovation Award category. So that's what it was. Awesome. Hey, somebody, he, somebody just said your book is sold out on Amazon UK when he last uh, looked. Hey. I'll have to figure that out, James. I'll have to make a few phone calls. Yeah, let's get that book out there. This is an <laughs> awesome book. Let me bring myself on the screen. That way people can see both of us. Hey, there we go. Um, this is one of my favorite books. And if you guys didn't see the review, um, I had in the background, I used to have a stack of books that I used constantly. And when I first started talking to John, I said, I don't know for sure if I have your book. And he said, yes, you do. It's right there behind you on top. And I turned around, I looked and there it was. And the book is all, it's all used up. You can see where I fold it and use it and stuff. Lots of great recipes. So I highly recommend you guys, you know, go out there and get it. There's so much information besides just recipes, but we're not here to talk about his book. We are here to talk about his experience 
Um, oh, I remember what I forgot to say earlier. Also, you're also a chef and you used to own a restaurant, which is fantastic. So you have a little bit of experience when it comes to cooking food. <laughs> I like to think so, James. Yeah, a lot more than me. Now, I did own a restaurant back in Western Washington, Kirkland. I saw we had someone here from Western Washington that said hello earlier. Um, but I could not cook. I hired people that could cook. <laughs> that was great. But we are here today to talk about protein. And this may be a shocking episode, guys. Um, we're not just going to be talking about plant-based protein. We're going to be talking about animal-based protein and how you can work it into your renal diet. Yes, I said work it in to your renal diet. You don't have to run for the hills <clears throat> when you see meat, steak, chicken, fish, things like that. There are things to look for. And when I was first diagnosed, um, my doctor told me, don't be eating hot dogs. If you're gonna, when you eat meat, and I needed it because I had anemia and he wanted me to eat it for the iron and other stuff. So I want you to eat a balanced diet. I want you to eat a balanced meal and pick quality meat. McDonald's doesn't count. Burger King doesn't count. Wendy's doesn't count. Get quality meat when you do eat meat and add veggies to your meal. Because my only veggies before were the garnish. The lettuce, tomato, onions, pickles on my giant double cheeseburger, like, you know, half pound burgers that I'd get. <laughs> so um, when it comes to protein, what, what is your your stance with protein and a renal diet? And, and, and with your experience on dialysis, now having a transplant? Well, dialysis, we can start with that, is, is very different. Um, they want you to increase your protein intake. And they're not as particular about maybe using plant-based plant -based proteins. Mm -hmm. Because there is so much that gets pulled out of you through that machine, James, they really need you to pump it up. Uh, yeah. So they'll tell you that. You know, They'll say, look, we need you to be back on. And, and the pre-dialysis, one of the reasons they're now switching to this low protein or very low protein diet and pushing the plant-based stuff, um, is because they think that there's a program that they can help slow down the any degeneration of the kidney, mm -hmm. um, and that's because. And again, I'm just going to step on into an area where I am not the expert, uh, unlike yep. your other guests. But I mean, certainly you have to do. I had to do a lot of research before I wrote the book and could tell the people these things. But the when the when the body processes protein, it creates waste, and that waste is what damages and can't be processed by the kidney. So it, as it goes through, it doesn't get processed. It stays in your body. Um, and, you know, that's so that that's why they want to put you on a lower level of protein so that you don't have the increase in waste in your body and also that it could possibly do less damage to your kidneys. Now, they say that the research is or I should say the research is suggesting that it's going to delay the process. So which is fantastic. So if you know anybody out there who's not been on dialysis, certainly you don't want to go there. Or if you mm -hmm. do have to, you want to try to delay it. Um, yep. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to right. hopefully slow down our decline. If we can halt it for a while and avoid or delay getting on dialysis. Right. And not all the doctors are on board with this. Some, I, it's an <laughs> odd thing, but some of them yeah. aren't. And some of them don't necessarily, uh, support the plant-based programs. Uh, so it, again, it, once you get to a point where you are on dialysis, you really do want to increase your protein levels, uh, beforehand, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, our, there's an argument about it. Um, I, I, but again, I always support eating more fruits and vegetables based as we talked about on this um, standard American diet, you know, we need more. So I don't want to come off as suggesting that, that the plant-based issues or plant-based diets are uh, not good or not the right direction. Mm -hmm. We always need more of that. I mean, that's yep. just part of the way the American, uh, the way we eat and a lot of the processed foods we have. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to do is to help out people who do choose to eat meat, whether it's pre-dialysis or whether it's during dialysis and find out some information that you can use and apply to your daily either shopping habits or eating habits to help you out and get the proper amounts of the proper things when you do eat meat. 
Yeah, and just to let everyone know, um, and some people have, have picked it up before in some of my past uh, broadcasts with Jen, the renal dietitian, who'll be on back yeah. on, on Tuesday. Um, I say I am vegetarian slash vegan, except for when I'm not. Um, I used to be a big, big meat eater. I every meal had some kind of a meat. And dinner, since I traveled so much for work, and well, they were picking up the tab, uh, was always a giant ribeye. Just <laughs> I do miss they're so those. good, James. I still do. I know when they're cooked right, and it's quality meat, unbelievable. But now I, you know, I added so many plant-based products to my food. I used to never eat a salad. A salad was like stuff that fell off your hamburger. Um, it was not a, a part of the meal for me. Now I eat a lot of vegetables, but I still eat meat. Now, because of how busy this week is with all these broadcasts every day and, and getting all set up and making sure things are ready and the graphics and stuff for each new show, I haven't eaten meat today or yesterday or the day before. I bought a lot of pre-made salads. I made up a bunch of dressing beforehand so that it's easy for me to get a lunch, get a dinner without having to do any prep. Uh, but I was planning because my wife and kids are gone for the weekend. I was planning to have a delicious lunch at a steakhouse that is open, that is being careful with COVID and all that. I was planning to go in there and get me an, uh, not a big, but maybe um, eight, 12 ounce, I'm gonna be honest, 12 ounce ribeye and a bunch of asparagus and a little salad and just, oh, I was gonna be in heaven today. <laughs> but I got busy and I haven't done that. But normally I do try occasionally to, to work in meat. I am not anti-meat, I am pro adding more fruits, vegetables, you gotta have that plant-based mm -hmm. stuff. And when it comes time for my labs, I do go all vegan for like a week before getting labs. And I can see the difference, um, <laughs> especially with my BUN. Cause eating, yeah. uh, I, if I eat a ribeye and I went and got my BUN, I don't know what it would be, 60 or something, uh, <laughs> instead of 20, 25 where we <laughs> want it to be. Uh, <laughs> So if I eat meat too closely in my labs, my BUN just shoots up. Um, but your BUN is one of those things you can kind of impact rather quickly through your diet. So I just want people to know, I'm not anti-meat. I am a meat eater. Uh, I know my wife's sister probably just cringed if she's watching this because they're all vegetarians and they're very proud that I am promoting plant-based so much more. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I see some people saying, oh, they're making a hunger at the ribeyes. Um, <laughs> but, but I am okay with meat, and you guys will find some lean chicken, some quality red meats. Um, and that's about pretty much the only meats I do eat. I, I'm not a fish person or shrimp or anything like that. But just in case anyone's wondering, like, holy cow, we've always been talking about plant-based. This is that video where we're going to say, hey, Let's talk about meat because some of you are going to add it to your diet and there's ways to do it. Yeah. And you were just talking about the, your BUN levels. Uh, yeah. You know, your blood, urea, nitrogen. Uh, one of the waste products that is created when you eat meat are these uh, nitrogen based wastes and urea, uric uh, acid uh, are, are part of those. I have a note too, because I knew there was another one, ammonia and creatinine. Mm -hmm. Those are the waste products that occur when you eat meat. Now, again, your body isn't gonna hold on to them forever if your kidneys right. are operating. It's just maybe gonna take a little longer to process them out if you're pre, um, pre-dialysis. So, you know, by gaming the system like you do, James, I'm sure your numbers might be a little better when you don't provide all that in your body before you go for the blood yeah. work. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I also look at the bright side. You spent those three, four, five days uh, reducing your protein level, et cetera, you know, and not eating meat, which is hard to process, again, for the kidneys. Uh, yeah. And so, I don't go crazy. You know, I was planning to go crazy with like a 12-ounce uh, ounce ribeye. Sure. I was planning to do that, and that is crazy. Um, but I, I used to, oh my God, let me tell you, if they had a, a, a 16 ounce ribeye, oh, I would buy one of those and the small ones. And that would be my dinner. 
I thought I'd meet James, but it's I know. so good. I, I was understand. back in the day. <laughs> It, it was just like the the movie The Great Outdoors with John Candy, where he gets that like I don't know ninety six ounce slab of meat and he has to eat it all, <laughs> including the gristle. But that was me. Now I get it's pretty much about the size of my palm, of my hand. It's a more reasonable amount. It's it's the appropriate amount, and I don't go yeah. crazy. But normally I would have chicken breast or something like that, or. I just absolutely love ribeye. It is the red meat for me is ribeye. Um, there's no other red meat that I'd prefer. I'd rather just get some chicken or skip it. Um, is that right? Yeah, you're a ribeye guy. Oh, the flavor is just unbelievable when it's cooked right. And part of this COVID thing has, has kind of made it hard for me to eat ribeyes because I did get one not too long ago, um, probably a month, a month and a half ago. I ordered one. Went and picked it up, drove home. Now, of course, it's meat, so it's still cooking. And by the time I got home, it was overcooked. And I was like, yeah. oh, that's not going to work for me. Well, James, you know, a no. good, fully cooked piece of meat, especially steak, doesn't travel well. Yeah. And, it, and I and I can't it cook it like very it. well at home, even on the grill. I haven't gotten to that point yet. <laughs> we'll work on that, James. I'll, I'll give you some good tips about buying the proper thermometer, making sure, you know, you know there's the thumb test, you know, have you ever seen people use the, no, the palm? Let me tell I got the thermometer. I bought one of those ones that works wirelessly to my iPhone. Don't know where uh -oh. I put it. I had plans. I had big plans. <laughs> yeah. I have hope for you, James. I do. <laughs> I think we can work on that part. Yeah. Um, but there's another part to that too. I don't know if that's in the other part. You know, it, when we so we've talked about the waste, right? We mm -hmm. we wanted to talk about that, and uh, there's another aspect to it, which is the balance of omega threes and omega sixes in in meats. You know, if you have been either pre, if you're pre or if you're on dialysis, or if you're just trying to eat healthy, you know, people take supplements. They'll take omega three supplements, and. Mm -hmm. Part of that is to raise the omega-3 levels. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run right into an area where, you know, maybe we, you'd want to speak to your renal dietitians or Jan or yep. something. But this is, again, part of the research I have done. So it's not, um, I'm not just off the top of my head where there is no hair. It's a, you know, science. <laughs> it's part of the science. But it, it, uh, we, we increase omega-3s because we want a better balance of omega-3s to omega-6s. And when the and our diet tends to be really high in omega six, so, and when they're really out of balance, when they get to a, you know, above a four to one ratio, four sixes to three, you know, to um, one threes, it starts to affect inflammation, and mm. inflammation has become not just a cause but a, a, an effect of a lot of ailments. So that's one of the other great benefits about knowing what kind of proteins you're eating, knowing the meats and understanding the balance between omega-3s and omega-6s to get them better, the ratio better, and mm -hmm. then to help provide less inflammation. Yep. And then when it comes to the meat, I, I'm so tempted to jump ahead to your slide. I'm trying not to. I know you want to go. You want, if we can do that if you want, then we can keep talking after. Yeah, let's so do that because I have okay. questions, okay. but they're all buried just, in your yeah, deck at different points. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, go. Let's so, see what we got. So let's switch this over. So we should go in the tiny corner. Here we go, everybody. Whoop, ah, there we are. We swap sides when we got shrunk. <laughs> so here's some of the things we've talked about, right, James? Mm -hmm. the, when I talk about proteins, and I, I really focus on meats, but I will bring some examples in, I think, later, uh, because you're going to find proteins in um, in other areas. So, you, you know, we want to know what, what our needs are and what stages. How much do we need? Now, your, your renal dietitian is probably going to be the best guide for that, mm -hmm. along with your other care team and your doctor. They're going to tell you. And they're going to give you that number of gram, grams of protein per body weight. So you'll know and they'll come up with a number for you. Um, it's also important to know how much phosphorus is in each one of those. And, and that becomes a really big issue and has been for a long time and is lightening up a little bit. But we'll talk about why. Uh, so in other words, different proteins have different amounts of phosphorus and they have a different ratio of how much phosphorus to protein there is. So you really want to be careful of that. Um, and I'm going to do a little sidestep and say, in my book, James, in the back, mm -hmm. there's these charts that tell you exactly how much oh. 
Uh, and, I, and I try to be so like, many like, great charts back here. You have to you actually you turn the book like this. Yeah, you have so to many charts, <laughs> color, lots of great information. I in try here. to do it with like what a normal person would eat. In other words, yeah, the different types of meat. So it's not just chicken, but it's the chicken wing, a chicken leg, chicken thighs, chicken breast, and then also a cooking style. And they all produce different amounts of phosphorus and protein, which would give us a different phosphorus to protein ratio. So hold on, you just said Meaning, some cooking styles that impacts how much phosphorus there is? Sure can. Um, certain styles of cooking with meats in particular can do that. Now, let's if, if that doesn't sound right to you right away, anybody who's been on this and understands the diet knows that if you want to eat a potato, what do you do, James? Well, you double boil it, at least. Right. And leach it. Leach the potato. So what that does <laughs> Not is... Not double boil, okay, leach it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Cook, you know, put it in water either for overnight and then change the water a few times or, or cook it and then change the water. And you're doing that. You're, you're pulling the, some of the nutrients out of that potato. And in this case, it's a potassium for that one. Mm -hmm. Right, James? I think it's potassium. Yep. So the cooking style of, can, for, for meat can actually reduce the phosphorus levels like Ooh. boiling vegetables can pull all of the – uh, could pull a large part or some parts of the nutrients into the water and you lose those nutrients. Now, that's not good for certain vegetables, but it right. could be good for meat, and it is. So things like uh, boiling, which we really don't do a lot of, um, but, you know, there are a lot of ways to cook meat in, you know, in a stew for, for, for that matter. Uh, so we have different processes, and I showed them there in the in the chart. So I didn't want to, I just wanted to give you a little bit of, of a clue yeah. about what's in there, just to show you that there's a difference, and you can then actually kind of leach phosphorus out of the meats. Uh, so anyway, that's the different different types of meat, and then the different cuts of meat, and then also um, the different styles of cooking. Um, so that's part of it. Now the newest part is the bioavailability of phosphorus. So you talk when they talk about say this plant based diet, what we're what they're utilizing is saying, hey, we think, and, and this is the science talking, mm -hmm. we, the science says that you can, um, you can eat higher phosphorus foods and the plant diet, and it will not absorb, it won't be As bio much. Right. Right. And the meat, if it's an organic, meat is organic, uh, you know, because, versus inorganic, which is additives, uh, that was only going to uh, absorb or be bioavailable at a higher, but yet still not 100%. And the additives that you see in ingredients, those are going to be absorbed into your body 100%. Mm -hmm. So that's what we talk about. We talk about bioavailability of phosphorus. Um, so that I have made some adjustments in the charts that we show you just to give you some ideas. Uh, you know, then there are other concerns. You know, how much sodium is in there? How many fat, how much fat, fats? Uh, and that you as an individual might need to control because we all have different things that we need to control. Sodium is almost universal because of our, our normal diets, uh, but it's there. Here we go. So we're talking about omega-6 and omega-3s, about getting mm -hmm. the right balance in. And here's the last one, James. And it's not a huge problem because we all do eat some meat and meat and dairy and cheese. Those are complete proteins. But there can be times and your renal dietitians, they all know this and they all take care of it. You know, they know what they're doing. Yep. Um, but if you're not have you don't have the availability and you're going all plant based, you need to be able to careful, making sure that your proteins are complete proteins, which means that they have all the nine essential nine essential amino acids in yep. them, and the right amounts. They almost all are going to have you know have some of them, but you've got to get it in the right proportion. Mm -hmm. And each chart in the book for each recipe identifies the protein levels, the nine essential amino acids how much is in there, and whether or not that recipe can, is considered a complete protein. Uh, and I think that can be very helpful. It's a little bit in the weeds as far as the science and the numbers, but I do put big things that say, hey, this is not a complete protein, et cetera. So uh, yep. those are just some of the factors, I think, that go into what I do and do my work trying to provide information in a recipe. So I didn't just see if it tastes good. I had to kind of work all these things in there to make sure that it, I understood them and that they were, so I was providing a good solid protein or meal. Now, hold on. Let me check are, one thing. Um, someone said their screen is black. Can somebody confirm that you guys are seeing a presentation up on the screen and not a black screen? And then we 
John and I are I, little tiny people down in the window. Make sure you guys can see it. Somebody let me know in the comments. Now we have about a 30 second delay before they hear that and get the comment. <laughs> so let's address a question that popped up. Oh no, people are saying theirs is good. Perfect. Okay. Um, Sorry for the we, individual that doesn't kind of know. Yeah, we did have a question that came up that's related to this. They say there's a local place in their town that can steam a brisket. Now that sounds good. Um, sure. Is that a safer way to leach? No. <laughs> Okay. So let's think about when you steam vegetables. When you steam vegetables, it's a great way to retain the nutrients. Yep. So steaming, smoking the brisket is smoking it delicious. Steaming it, eh, uh, no. But for corned beef, I boil mine. I, I, I actually braise it. I put them in, uh, I take a brisket and I put it, like, you know, again, this is corned beef. This isn't going to be a fresh brisket that you're going to want to use barbecue style sauce on. But um, I will put it in a you know half full of a pan, uh, submerge it half deep in a pan or a slow cooker, and then the phosphorus will leach into the water. Yep. And that's where it goes. So steaming doesn't necessarily work. Great for vegetables to retain all the nutrients. Mm -hmm. Not so great for the phosphorus. Yep. Good. That makes sense. All right. Are you ready to go to the next slide? Because then we got ready. some meat options. All right. Here's the good stuff, guys. All right, okay. picking beef. So, okay, this is this is a part that a so many of us are afraid of. Right. Um, so this is this photo I used for something we used to uh, that I used to cook a lot, and it's not great because it's a big, huge, you know, piece of meat. It's the <laughs> bisteca bisteca uh, Florentine, which is a Florentine style. Oh wait, I was gonna say that's not that large, but now I see the thermometer. It is a lot yeah, yeah, bigger than I thought. It's really, really thick. It's <laughs> and is that some there. rosemary there? Rosemary in there. We used to cook it anyway. Mm, so delicious. This so looks good. I know. So we're gonna talk about uh, that's not what we're gonna, we're gonna use beef, right? Uh, as again in the book, I give you the numbers. Um, for everything. So the most important thing to look for is 100% organic grass fed, like it says. And the reason, here's the primary reason. It has a significantly better omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. So it gives you a better program. And, and you know, I think it's the eight or nine to one, and I have it listed uh, for other cuts or, or for non-organic, but it gets it gets down to six or something like that, um, or six or five to one, something to that effect with organic beef. The other parts, of course, is that you know you're getting grass-fed, which mm -hmm. just means you're not eating all that grain. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why you want to do that. The only issue had been for a while, this is a long time ago, was that the labeling wasn't always as accurate as it should be. So if you look for 100% organic grass-fed beef, all of those in there, you're going to find that you're going to get a better product both for your body and for your kidneys, even though we know not the greatest uh, as far as the waste goes, meaning the, the, the protein waste. Yeah. So that's, that's where portion you know. control comes in. We just don't eat too that's much of exactly. it, but get right. quality. And it's going to be a little more expensive. What better yeah. way also to help with your portion control, James? If it's mm -hmm. so expensive, you just can't <laughs> eat that much. But it's going to satisfy <laughs> that taste. So well now, if you're going to just use, say, burgers or ground beef for whatever you use, meatballs, uh, you know, or as a stuffing, uh, I, I always say to avoid ground beef. If it just says beef, let's talk about the processing. I don't want to, don't want to discourage too many people, but if it doesn't have a significant uh, reference to a cut of meat, mm -hmm. it just means it's all the scraps, you know, pieces and pieces and parts that have you know, from the butchery, uh, and, and they just kind of throw it all together. So it'll it'll be accurate as far as the percentage goes, 80, 20, 85, 15, mm -hmm. but we don't know where it's coming from, and it can be a little, uh, you know, maybe it's not going to taste as good. That's why it's cheaper. Yeah. So I always choose either ground chuck or ground sirloin. I know where the cut's coming from. Hey, if I can get organic 100% grass-fed chuck, even better. If you're really into the cooking thing, James, which you may not be, but I am. I'm I going to be. I, yes, I, I want have... to be able to make more delicious meals. I actually now enjoy cooking. I look forward to it. You know, it's, it's, it's like almost like making music or painting something. 
You're making oh, something really so, awesome. And then you are the judge. You then get to enjoy it. You know, not only does it look right. cool and impress people, but then it just tastes. And there's some, there are a few things I've made. It's not very many that when I bite into it, I'm like, oh my goodness. I can't believe I made this. This is so good. I would pay at a restaurant and not be upset for this. And I want to be able to do that with meat one day. Um, so that I can make a ribeye when I want one. Because then I can just have small it. ones occasionally instead of exactly. right. saving um, up and going and getting one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Excuse me. So um, I think that's where we... Oh, I, I was going to say, James, sorry, pardon me, but uh, I have a grinder. Mm -hmm. So I will buy a piece of chuck or sirloin that is 100% organic grass-fed, and I will grind my own beef yep. so that I have my own burgers. Now I know exactly where it came from. I know what went into it. I know how much extra salt, if there is any, which it might be. Um, but I, I just, and I know the fat content. So I can kind of judge based on how much fat I use. So that's the best way to go if you want burgers. But if not, they'll have it. You'll find it in either ground chuck, ground sirloin. You can even find 100% organic ground beef. Uh, I have, I bought that. Um, I saw one of the comments just said, yeah, it is really expensive, but it, it is. Uh, but that's that's part of the the foods our food system our supply chain and you know stuff we need to really work on. Yep. So that's the area I, I think that's the stuff we promote. I would promote in beef. You, now what about when, what about like hot dogs, sausages? James, uh, I wouldn't eat a hot dog. I haven't eaten a hot dog. Some of them, let's just put it this way, for the most part. Um, Certainly, it's it's a highly processed food. It has a lot of sodium. Um, I, I just think you're going to want to stay away from them. There are some high quality brands, and that's okay. If you can make sure you get the proper labels, usually they're pork. Pork's going to be a little higher in your phosphorus levels uh, for the most part, provided it is pork. Um, there are beef dogs, same thing. They're not going to produce the best beef. I don't think you're going to find, maybe you will, 100% organic grass-fed beef hot dogs. Hey, if you can, you know, you're, you're, you're getting on a better, on the better track. Uh, so yep. they might be there. Yeah. So I'll tell you, but yeah. I, I, my, my restaurant that I used to have, we were similar to a Subway, you know, but instead of sandwiches, we were hot dogs and then like pulled pork, roast beef sandwiches and stuff like that. And when I was trying to find a hot dog vendor, so many of them came in and it's about the price and how they, you know, 10 dogs to a pound, it costs this mm. much. And, you know, who's the cheapest? It was a race to the bottom. But one vendor came in and he said, I want to show you, we are the most expensive. I'm going to show you a video of how most hot dogs are made. And he opened oh. up his computer. <laughs> I will never ever eat a Costco dog uh, ever again or buy a hot dog at the store. I right. saw how they were made and I saw how they prepare the scraps. It is yeah. the scraps. And then he said, let me show you how we make our hot dogs. It was all shoulder beef. Um, it was similar to you buying a giant piece of meat and going to a grinder and adding spices and stuff. And then they use the natural casing from a sheep. Casings, yeah. Which then I learned what part of the sheep that is. It's not. It's not really conducive to um, a hot dog uh, broth eating contest yeah. when you see those videos. Oh. But, <laughs> but I, I know. then that made my decision. I was like, okay, I'm going to focus on quality. We're going with this, um, and we went with a, a very expensive. Um, someone's Abby's asking, is it Nathan's? No, we did not go with Nathan's. Uh, we went with Boar's Head, and oh, yeah, sure. and then went for our sausages. We went with a local company that allowed us to select the spices and the exact ingredients that we wanted in it, and everything was high yeah, quality. But but I asked I asked about the hot dogs because I will never eat a hot dog again. Uh, if it's a Boar's Head one, I might you know oh that would be good with some cream cheese, some sweet chili sauce, or something like that. Uh, but boy, yeah, I'm just stacking yeah, on stuff I, I shouldn't be eating. But I just ask, because I know a lot of people are thinking, ah, beef, beef hot dogs. If I, are those good? I'll get a name brand one. Is it quality? Hot dogs are pretty much, for the most part, the leftovers. And I'm, I'm talking leftovers. 
<laughs> if you guys have ever watched The Great Outdoors, the second reference to the movie The Great Outdoors, <laughs> the raccoons are digging through the trash and they find hot dogs. They don't want to eat them. And they describe them. Um, I'm not going to repeat how they describe them, but that is true. <laughs> All the leftover pieces go in there, so don't eat the right. don't eat the hot dogs. Um, and I agree with most of the renal politicians that I've ever talked to, which is, look, you know, it doesn't mean you can never eat a hot dog. It just shouldn't be part of your cycle in a diet, and mm -hmm. that might be it. You know, I mean, if you're at a, a summer picnic and you have a couple of times a summer, I mean, it, it's not going to be horrible. It's but uh, you you don't want to be regular part and and. You know, that's part of that quality of life that uh, they, sh they talk about. Renal dietitians will talk about. Um, yep. You know, so just and know funny, what you're doing. You know, maybe you'll eat badly for the next day. Sure. A funny hot dog story before we go on to the next slide. Last year at a Cincinnati kidney walk, um, one of our local sponsors, and I appreciate every single sponsor that supports kidney disease and helping kidney patients. That is awesome. But they served up chili cheese dogs at the kidney walk. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's a great company. It's Cincinnati, so chili is, is big in Cincinnati. Uh, sure. But I was like, oh, oh I, I couldn't eat it. I'm like, it's the hot dog, it's the chili, it's the cheese. It's like, oh, at a kidney walk. <laughs> but I, I did. I do appreciate the sponsors. It is very good for them to support us. Anyone who supports kidney disease, awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. Are we ready for the next slide to go beyond beef? Uh, yeah. Hang on, James. I just want to add. Yep. Uh, and again, I'm going to do a little plug there. I do have a chili recipe, believe it or not, in yes. the book. Yes. And I have it marked. As a matter of fact, it, hold on. I think I even referenced Cincinnati chili. All I have not looked health. at this book. For the chili thing in a while, but I think, if I remember right, I think it's this one. Hold on. Oh no, boneless buffalo wings. Oh, this sounds good. All right, but yes, I've seen your recipe in there in your so anyway, instructions. Just, but there are ways to do that with with chili, and you know, there's there's a way. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Now, well, since we're talking about beef, so anyway. Now we do have a question that's beef related. They're asking, what's okay. the best way best way to cook steak so that it's tender? Do you marinate or do you use a rub? I don't use either. Ooh. And I am a little bit of a purist. I like the added flavors that come with the rubs or even a marinade, but it depends on the type of meat, too. So, for instance, what cut of meat are we talking about? Is it a pure, just a cut of steak? I'm not going to do anything. Um I have kind of devised uh, from multiple sources. I, I didn't invent this. I utilize all of the resources, cooking channel, cooking shows, other chefs. When I cook a steak, James, I now use uh, a uh, chimney. Now, if you are a barbecue person, you know what a chimney is. And that's just a cylindrical metal container with a handle on it that you use to start the coals and then you throw them into your barbecue i don't know if you're familiar with that james maybe not yeah they're usually silver and i think slanted at the exactly. tip yeah right but inside there is a grate so that all the coals don't fall through so what i have been doing and again I, I'm, I'm not taking credit for it because i didn't uh -huh. invent it but man it's the best way i pack that thing with coals like you would if you're going to start your barbecue but rather than dump those coals I set the steak on the barbecue, and then I take that container and I put it right over the top. And it creates a, an extraordinarily oh. high heat, like in a yeah. steakhouse. Yeah, and so then you're searing the outside. The, right, and then you flip, so if it takes about two minutes, depending on how hot you can get it, then you flip it over and do the same thing. And then you can just set it off to the side on a low heat area if you already started the grill. Or I've even got a small little grate that I put on top of it. And I put the steak on there. So now I've got the smoke coming up and I let it slowly heat and warm to get it to the proper temperature. Yeah. It's a long way to tell you how to cook a steak. But oh, that's what I've been doing now. You can that find that sounds on, good. Uh, on um, other uh, on online ways. But anyway. That, so yeah. When I went. And I don't like, I like my steak, you know, my ribeye, just dish the ribeye, maybe a little salt, a little pepper. That's it. I don't want, yes. I want to take, if I'm eating the meat, 
I want to be able to taste all the flavor in it. And if it's cooked right and it's a quality one, every bite tastes delicious. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to have to go get one tomorrow. Yeah. Let's talk about the rubs in those uh, marinades, though. You're adding a lot of sodium most of the time. Oh, yeah. You could be adding a lot of other things that aren't, being, aren't, you know, aren't necessarily good. In other words, if you're using a store-bought rub uh, or sodium, they're going, they, uh, I'm sorry, or uh, marinade, they could be adding phosphates, which could be getting into the meat and getting in. So that's 100% direct um, absorption of yep. those phosphates and other chemicals, uh, inorganic uh, uh, items that they've, they've put on there. So that's the other reason I do it. If I'm going to use a rub on anything, I make sure I make my own and utilize whole spices if possible, a grinder and make it uh, that way. Yep. Again, that's awesome. kind of the best way. So somewhere in that range is good. If you can find that. <laughs> We're making people hungry. You guys <laughs> know, I don't eat, I usually eat dinner early, but when I do a show like this, I don't eat dinner till after it. <laughs> I am so hungry. <laughs> and and there's going to be nothing open after this. I've got a salad waiting in the fridge. That's what I get to look forward to after talking about all this. <laughs> Sorry, James. <laughs> oh, no, no. It'll just make me look forward to lunch tomorrow even more. Exactly. That much better. All right. Let's go to the next slide. You ready? Yep. Boom. Now we're going to start talking about some seafood, which to me, all seafood. I do is I just see it and I ignore it. Uh, my, when I was little, we went fishing a lot. We cleaned the fish. We ate it. And I don't know what happened. Maybe it was just having bones in it and stuff like that, but something happened. It clicked. I don't, I don't want fish. Don't want seafood. The only fish I would eat and don't cringe, okay? Every dietitian in the world listening is about to cringe. The only fish I would eat was Long John Silver's. Yeah. Because <laughs> you, you got the thinnest little fish, deep fry with tons of just fat and sodium and all sorts of bad things on it. Oh, James. <laughs> Covered in like a half inch of tartar sauce. Pretty much the fish was to keep the tartar sauce on my spoon on the way up to the mouth. <laughs> there was no taste of fish whatsoever. <laughs> oh, boy. So what do we well, got here for shrimp? So I've chosen shrimp because um, of the, the high, because of the benefits. Uh, most seafood, not all, but most seafood is going to have similar and very good qualities. Um, you know, when we talk, when they give you omega-3 pills or fish pills, what they're really trying to do is what we talked about earlier is raise the omega-3 fatty acids. And in this case, you can see that the, it, it has very high omega-3s. It has, mm -hmm. so therefore the high omega-3s and a very low omega-6s omega gives it a great ratio. It's also a lot lower in phosphorus for protein. So in other words, the, the phosphorus to protein ratio is very low and the low means it's good. Um, so in this particular case, shrimp has one of the lowest phosphorus to protein ratios. So that's pretty good. The problems are going to come here when you get to purchasing. Now, this there is a long history, and this is the supply chain part of food that a lot of people may or may not be aware of. And you should be – and for us as kidney patients, we have to be cautious. But fray shrimp is mostly – mostly comes from overseas – as a matter of fact, a lot of our shrimp comes from overseas. Ooh. One of the reasons is that because the Gulf shrimp or the Carolina shrimp is so good that you can get a higher price for it overseas. So they sell it and then they actually import the stuff from overseas, you know, in, in certain parts of the world. And they are either farm raised, which means there's less controls and they have a lot of other problems with the quality of the water that the shrimp are raised in, and that ends up in the shrimp. In addition to that, James, this is well documented in another book. Um, the labeling at the ports Ooh. is horrible. Not the port people. They're not doing anything wrong. but Right, they're just unloading kind of the boats. Of, right, so it's just that you're, <laughs> in other words, there's some places that we've even found are doing this that have it, and then they mislabel mm -hmm. their shrimp, and they ship it to another country, so it looks like it's coming from somewhere else. So. There's just a bunch of stuff in there that a normal body might be able to process, but may, our bodies may not be able to with, with kidney issues. So 
I say you, have, you should almost always buy a wild caught and as close to you as possible to avoid the farm raised uh, because of the control problems and the other issues with the shrimp. Now, you can buy um, fr uh, frozen, which is fine. Frozen wild caught is probably the best way that you're going to get it. Um, and uh, it doesn't take long. Shrimp doesn't take long to, to thaw out. Everybody, anybody who cooks it knows that. Uh, but it's really good. So it's got a lot of quality protein in it, low in phosphorus, great ratio for your omega-6s, can help bring the whole day in balance uh, as long as you use wild caught and uh, preferably low, uh, as local as possible and frozen yeah. is fine. And most, um, most seafood or fish falls into this type of category? Most seafood does. It varies, but the, the shrimp and has, somehow ends up to be the, the best one. Um, as far as the numbers goes, which I think I, I show you uh, in the book, you see all of it. Like I got yep. octopus, shrimp, and cod, and catfish, and they gave you the whole the whole gamut of fish that you could probably eat. Maybe not all of them, but and it it just kind of lays it out for you. Phosphorus to protein ratios. Here they are. Uh, so you get great omega threes, maybe not great uh, um, uh, protein uh, phosphorus levels, but good. At least almost all good uh, phosphorus levels. Yeah. So a few questions related to fish. Um, sure. Being here in Ohio, I know a lot of relatives are catching fish, catfish, bass, things like that. Um, but those are freshwater fish. Those Do they, are, are they, waters. are they also yes, better? Yes, those are usually pretty good as well. And again, I have all that, all that information is in there. So if you're, if you're out catching fish, you know, as long as that water, that stream is good, it's not being polluted, you know, you should have no problems. Yep. So and then what a, what about sushi? Well, sushi is raw fish for the yep. most part, right? So, you know, that's... And you know, I, I never eat it. I mean, talk... Uh, yeah, eel, it could be anything. So remember, I'm a Long John fish. Silver's guy. It's right, not right. cooked or doesn't look cooked. I'm not even near it. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I often would probably... I, I would suggest to be careful with raw fish. Everybody knows that. But people who, who who work with in the sushi bars, they know what they're doing. They're, they're high quality. But you, so you're going to get the benefits. And I think the only downside is any potential issue with raw fish. And so mm -hmm. that's what you're that's what you're dealing with. Uh, when it is good. because it's not all raw, but it, you know most of it, uh, quite a bit of it, it can be. Yep. All right. Let's go to the next slide. See what we got here. It's like a right, surprise well, for everyone. Or do you have something else for for shrimp? No, no. I think we're good on that. All right. Here we go. Next is oh, probably the most common meat I eat, chicken. This right. is the one thing, the one kind of meat I actually can cook. My favorite, I have two favorite chickens. Um, lemon pepper, I love lemon. This goes way back. Oh, I make a killer lemon pepper chicken on the grill. Uh, and then I love like chicken piccata when I go out. Uh, that is not healthy because <laughs> I get I get <laughs> extra sauce, in there. extra yeah. capers. I think she's I'm just piling it all on. <laughs> but I, there was a time when I would go out and if I saw chicken piccata on the menu, I had to try it just to see what it was like. Uh, and again, no one from work is watching, but work was paying for my meal. So if I didn't really like it, eh, give me the ribeye. It's, it's okay. I'm not paying for both of them. Bring me a ribeye. <laughs> so what do we have for chicken? Oh, this is a, this one I, oh yes. I've seen commercials so chicken, about this. Yeah, chicken, we're gonna get to the, the base issues. It's just like we did with beef and shrimp. You know, what? let's talk about buying chicken, okay? So I'm gonna give you the rundown. Um, uh, we're going to use the word processing. That's how it, we're going to say processing is how chicken goes from being out there laying eggs, even though we wouldn't be eating, uh, you know, that uh, old of a chicken, um, into the package on the in the store. We're going to call that whole process process. Uh, that's all processing. So there are two ways to process a chicken, and uh, one way is called water cooling, which means that they bring the the chicken and to a read to the, the proper temperature you by using running it through cold water and they have these little machines and they're like long slides and they run them through so that process brings the chicken down in temperature so it can be continued to be broken down if they're going to do that uh, but unfortunately what happens is there will be retained water so water that gets retained from the process of cooling chicken okay um, but in addition to that that water is retained and reduces 
the flavor. Mm -hmm. So they started realizing this, the processors, and they said, well, look, we've got to add more flavor. So we are going to add water. Well, they might call it water. They might call it chicken stock. They might say other flavorings. Mm -hmm. That's another label, which would be water added. And you'll see that right on the label. Well, you won't see it. It's not so prominent. It's usually down in one of the corners. Yeah, but you got to look for it. Do. And it could be as high as 15% or 16% of stock and water and other flavorings. That's never good. So you'll notice that that's why that why one chicken breast is so much cheaper than the other chicken breast, you know, whether you're buying in bulk or individually. It's because of that. So if 15% of what you're buying is water and chemicals or uh, phosphates, because they are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's going to be cheaper. Now, <laughs> let's go further. Again, we're getting really deep, so I just hope you're not getting bored or this isn't bothering, you know, getting too much for anybody. Yeah. But they started to add water and they realized that during the shipping process and packaging that the water would run out. They started adding chicken stock. They found the same thing. So they started to add salt and phosphates. And that's when the moisture stayed in and all the way up yeah. to the cooking process. So now... Whatever water added is in there is made up of chicken stock, which could be a general term for sodium phosphates and chicken stock. It could be water. And it just jacks up all the numbers that we don't know about. So lowest amount of water added, zero if possible, and the limited amount of retained water. And that's all part of the water-cooled chicken. Yep. Okay? Now, there's another type which is called air cooled. And this is where they bring the processed chicken down to temperature in a refrigerator freezer type device. So there's no water, which means no loss of flavor. They don't have to add chicken. So yep. you look for that. So that's the way to buy chicken. So they reduce the, so chicken has phosphorus to begin with, but then we can always account for and know how much additional phosphorus and sodium is being added through the water added. Yeah. Long way to go. Yep. You know, I never even knew. This is brand new to me. So if I go to good? Costco, um, mm -hmm. is theirs air chilled or is it? Well, James, there's one you know? way to know. Yes, I, I do know. And because are they required to label it? If it's water cooled, it will never say anything except retain water, water added. There's water right in there. If they go... And the, through the process of air chilling it, they're going to smack it on the label just because they want to make sure you know and uh -huh. show that off. So you'll see the air chilled. And I think we have an example of that. Yeah, we do. I know. I know I saw it when I was so looking through the slides. Assume, I just didn't read to know what it meant. So now I know. Yeah, right. <laughs> but you should just assume all your chicken is water cooled unless it says very promptly air chilled. Yeah. Now, if I get a fast food type chicken, I go to a chicken joint and I get chicken, right. that's probably, I, you, they want it juicy. First, I know it's not good because they, they, they've got all sorts of stuff on there, spices, MSG, sodium, all sorts of stuff. Um, I'm guessing their chicken, since it is a cost issue there, is pumped with water and or probably well, even again, other stuff for flavor. A, if it's a fast food place or it's a low cost place, you know, you are in the restaurant business, you're going to buy off yep. the cheapest chicken you get. And that's going to be less chicken, more water and yep. um, more phosphates and more sodium. Um, and then they're going to add a bunch of other things on there, James, which is really important because that, uh, I mean, again, for the normal body, maybe mm -hmm. you can get rid of that. So yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. Horrible, but for us, we can't do it. You want to take a little sidebar here, James? You want to take a little tour, detour in the conversation? Because once I get started, I, I'm difficult to stop. <laughs> <laughs> hey, more but, information is better. This is great so for sodium. Remember how you yep. just said, oh, you know, they're, they're going to add all these things. They talked about rubs, how we're going to, you know, and I said they're very salty and you have to be yep. careful. You don't make oh. Sodium does this wonderful thing. You know, you, you put it on your food and it has its own flavor and it enhances the flavor of other things, James. And in theory, what there's what people are suggesting, again, research, is that sodium 
different flavors hit different parts of your tongue. Again, it's not that four spaces, but it's scattered all over the tongue, right? Yep. So you're going to get bitter. It can be scattered all over, but it's more predominant over somewhere. Same with sour and salt, you know, et cetera. Yeah. But sodium actually ha um, opens up other taste buds that wouldn't normally open up for, let's say, um, sour or sweet. So think about when they people start adding salty and sweet together. Uh huh. And, they, and people love it. You know, they're like, oh my God. Oh, salted caramel? Love? Oh my goodness. Salted Heaven. Yeah, you know, you know what, what's going on is that the caramel wasn't hitting all the taste buds, but with a little bit of sodium, they opened up extra taste buds. And then you got an, an enormous flow of flavor coming uh -huh. into more taste buds. So that's what people do with sodium. And that's why we love it. In addition to being, you know, something very important. And, you know, we need it, right? Uh, so anyway, that's just a little sidebar, a little extra information yep. on the sodium side outside of proteins. Oh, that is right. awesome. All right, here and we go. Go ahead. Next right. slide. We are now going to go. Oh, yeah, here's your, your examples. Yep. Here's our <clears throat> examples. So, so uh, this looks good. Up. Less than 2%. That sounds good. Especially that less than. I mean, there's <laughs> always going to be some retained water in the cooling. Now, let's go up. And I didn't even circle this, and I shouldn't have. But it says never pumped with sodium, with uh, solutions or additives, James. Oops. Right above. Up, 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 up. Yep. I was trying to move the circle. I forgot <laughs> I wasn't in edit mode. Yeah. <laughs> yes, right above. Never pumped with solutions or add. Oh, see, I like whatever this company is, they have a good marketing department because they're saying something positive, but they're also in a way saying, the other guys do that. We don't. Without pointing the fingers. I love, this is my style. <laughs> this is a Wegman, by the way. I, I don't think they mind. Since we're saying good things, I don't think yeah. anybody would mind. <laughs> so, it's a grocery store here. Uh, I like the no so preservatives, anyway, no artificial colors or flavors. I like uh, all of this. By the, by the way, those top two lines, um, those are just mandatory. Like you, you can't sell chicken unless you you follow those rules. Uh, and again, so that's just one of those little things. But it's nice to know that they're following the rules. Uh, but again, the there's nothing added in there. And the technical term in, in the processing world, I think, is called plumping. And they actually plump up. And so, you know, have you ever looked at a chicken in a store and you said, oh, it's so cheap. And it looks like this big, round plump. Mm -hmm. yeah. Damn, when they're processed, you know, go buy one that's, that's you know, from a, a butcher. And they, you know, you buy it and oh my God, it looks so scrawny and scraggly. Yeah. Well, that's because it's a real chicken and there's nothing put in there, nothing added to make it look so attractive. Mm -hmm. um, so at least in this particular instance, they're showing you that they haven't pumped it with solutions or added to the sand, very little retained water. Yep. All right. Our next one here, you got, ooh, here's one flavored with yeah. up to 15%. That sounds like a lot. I'm, I'm buying broth i'm buying flavored right. water right. right and again chicken broth is not a technical term so how do you make broth well we happen to add tons of phosphates and sodium and other things so yeah uh, you know you've got a lot going on there but again this these two this was just at a local um uh big box store like like costco but it wasn't costco so it's you they're everywhere and you can see there's a huge price difference between the two so you want to avoid these course this is yep. just an example and um, whenever okay. i think of broth i think it's what absorbed what what soaked out which is not the stuff we want in us well right it's not that i mean they, what they're trying to tell you here is oh you know we made chicken stock and we added it in well no you didn't you know what you did is you made some chicken flavoring and you put sodium and phosphates in there so that you could uh, plump it up. You could have a cheaper product because it's chicken and more, you know, per pound, because you're paying per pound on all these. Yep. So that's Hey, here's process. a question that came up. That's actually just a really good one. Um, is, do you know, is the majority of the naturally occurring phosphorus in the skin when it comes to chicken? Because I always I do, remove uh, all the I, skin. I, I, um, you know what? Just give me two I, seconds. I'm thinking that's in, the, in, in your book. I just can't remember. Yeah, and most of the fat is in the most of the fat is in the is in the skin, um, so I can just give you a quick look at this and see. Yeah, if I can that find would be it. fantastic. But I have it in here. It'll tell you 
skinless breasts, and I'm going to look and see because again, I, I'm sorry I don't have everything memorized in the oh, yeah. Hey, there, this book is loaded. Let me tell you, John, you won't believe how many people are saying I can't get it in England. I can't get it in the UK. <laughs> So. I've been working on that. I mean, I'm glad to hear someone said it was sold out, which means they could find it. Oh, and by the way, for the book, James, if this is what I tell people when they when they say that, it is produced by this particular company. And if you go to a local bookstore and say, "Hey, I would like you to order that," and I'm going to buy it, and you might have to pay for it on this book. Um, but if you go and they can order it from the company where they get all their books from. Yep. Um, They'll look it right up. They'll see it. Oh, it's an Ingram Spark book, so they can get it and uh, they can order it for you. So you may not be able to see it on Amazon right away, or it might take too long. But you could go to the bookstore and they so and they have printing companies all over the world. So it's not like they're going to yeah. print it in the U.S. Ship it over. The, it, there's a printing pl- process, uh, place in India. There's one in the U.K. Uh, you just have to go to the local bookstore and ask for it. And that is a um, great way to support your local small businesses or any local business. The you know, right now with all the COVID stuff, they're hurting. They could use some extra stopping in. Nothing against Amazon. I use Amazon every day. Packages arrive all the time. Um, but I, I I see the challenges local businesses are facing. And it, it's great to stop in or give them a call and say, hey, can you order this book for me? Plus, you're reminding them that, hey, we need more kidney stuff for these bookstores. Here at least in, in, in Ohio, around Cincinnati, there's not a single kidney book at Barnes and Nobles. Right. No, not right. a one. They all say, we can order it. And it was it was heartbreaking for me when I first got started because like, I don't want to wait to order it. I'll go to Amazon. I can at least get it in two days, but I'd rather have it now, especially when I was first diagnosed. I wanted every book so I could start flipping through them. So right. what'd you find? Sometimes, sometimes the libraries will have them too. Not necessarily yep. mine, but they can order them. Um, so what I found is that there's a there's 179 milligrams of sodium in a portion. I think it's a, a three ounce portion of a chicken breast with skin and, and uh, without skin, and uh, there's only 10 more with. So only it's less than 10 percent is in the skin. It's probably so. The the reason they don't want you to eat the, the skin and chicken is because of the fat content. And yep. because kidney patients have a lot of issues with their heart, they're trying to make sure that your cholesterol levels are checked. And that may not be so good with chicken, with the skin of, of chicken. But again, all that information is in there. It tells you exactly how much is uh, how much phosphorus is in a, a three ounce piece of chicken with a chicken breast with its skin versus chicken breast without the skin. And I did that for the, the others as well. Yep. And let's see, do we have another slide in here? I think we do. One? Oh yeah, we do. <gasps> Here's the air chilled. There it is. Okay, now this oh. one, this example says 100% air chilled. I'm guessing it's either air chilled or not. There's no 80%, exactly. huh? Exactly. So, and this, if I, I'm pretty sure I remember this is a whole chicken. Uh, yeah. You might have troubles finding a, um, a chicken in parts, you know, already broken down that's air chilled. But if you have a great butcher or a good store, they'll break it down for you. You know, you ask the butcher if they have one there. Some of these, especially the smaller places, say, "Look, I'm looking for air chill chicken. If they have it, yep. Can you break? Can you break it down? And all uh, you know, the, and the good butcher will do that for you. Maybe yeah, not and in Costco, uh, but I think a lot of people too. don't realize the local bakeries, the local butchers, can be really helpful for kidney patients. So when I was first diagnosed. I had to really restrict sodium. First of all, my heart has problems. I, I needed a lot of potassium, but I had to really, really restrict sodium. And I couldn't find any really low sodium bread, like at Walmart or anything like that. And I was told, go, go find a local baker and talk to them. So I found one and they would make me a loaf of fresh, and I could have made it myself, but I'm, I don't want to try it. Um, they would make me a loaf of fresh bread with very little salt in it. They still had to add some, very little. You do, yeah. And it barely cost more than the cheapest loaf at Walmart. If I would have went right. to like Whole Foods, it would have cost me more for a loaf of bread that was made who knows when ago and packaged. Mm. Um, so don't hesitate to look for a local baker and say, hey, look, here's my dietary restrictions. 
Can you make something for me? Or the butcher, you're looking, you know, do you have the air chilled? Here's the parts chicken I want. And yeah. leverage those. The the prepackaged stuff at Costco, Walmart, Kroger and stuff uh, isn't your only options. And we, I think a lot of us forget about that because we're so used to the convenience of going there for our groceries. Right, right, I agree. And let's see, what do we have after this? Oh yeah, here we go. So I'm a chart guy, James. I like numbers, I like I charts. I love charts too. Tell by the book. You know, uh, and for, if you are not a numbers and charts person, I understand that. Even in when I when I wrote the book, when I go to the, I have these big charts, I highlight the one in red that you should be looking at. So you can just look at the, find the thing to look at, you don't have to worry about all others. Oh, that's really high. And the number, one of the numbers we're looking at is that phosphorus to protein ratio. So I wanted to point this out just to bring in a general understanding of the plant-based versus the meats and the phosphorus issues. So I used portion sizes rather than exact protein sizes. So in other words, if mm -hmm. I wanted to compare the exact amount of protein with black beans or a relative amount, et cetera, I would have done that. But I, what I wanted to say is, you know, a three ounce is a really good size of ground chuck. Yep. And here's how much phosphorus in milligrams. Here's how much protein. And the ratio is, again, 8.53. Don't worry about that last column just yet. Same thing with chicken and shrimp. And you can see that the shrimp uh, has a, a ratio very mm -hmm. low. Six it's a low. I just that. looked at the beans. Yeah. So the ratio here for the shrimp is that it means it's got lots of protein and versus how much phosphorus. So you can even see the phosphorus number is so much lower in three ounces of shrimp, even though the protein level is lower. Mm -hmm. Now, the last one is a cup of black beans, which is a portion of black beans. Now, a lot of recipes will say, just eat a half a cup, you know, and you won't get a ton of phosphorus, which is true, but you mm -hmm. also won't get a ton of protein, which is good, and you won't get a ton of food either. You know, so you're going to end up eating other things. A half a yep. cup of beans is not a lot of food. Now, this was the original thinking. Like this, They looked at this numbers and they were like, wow, we really got to avoid black beans. I mean, for the amount of protein, you're getting 15, you know, that's almost double the amount of phosphorus per gram of protein. So they were avoiding it. But then came along the absorption issue. Well, how much is actually getting absorbed in the body? The range is uh, the average of the the ranges from the science uh, research is from 40 to 60, 40 for plants, 60, maybe a little more on either end for meats. So what I did is I applied 60% to the top three and 40% to the bottom one so that you could see what the absorption of the uh, phosphorus wow. in each product is and then ran a phosphorus to protein ratio. So what you see is that they're lower. But, you know, they really come down and the phosphorus and protein levels yep. uh, when they, we account for absorption. So even though black beans are much higher at this point than the others, like they were previously, you're still getting a lot, a lot less. You know, only 40% of the phosphorus is going in, but you're still getting, yep. not getting a lot of protein. So they can be very good. You know, that's a, it's a positive thing for the plant-based diet programs, mm -hmm. lowering phosphorus and lowering proteins. But again, I often, I know people are going to eat meat. I mean, that, I sat in that dialysis room and there was not a, I think there was one or two vegetarians in the, all of the, all of it. There was, you know, that's three shifts a day, two different schedules. There was a hundred chairs, 90 chairs in there. And I talked to people, especially the dietitians, and they're like, yeah, we have a couple of vegetarians, and that was a while ago, but that's it. So now that there's yep. more, and there, you know, I don't know what it is in dialysis compared to the early stages, but I want to give you the information. You know, mm -hmm. Here's just a kind of a solid look at it. Uh, anyway, I hope that's very helpful um, and not confusing and just too many numbers thrown at you. Again, <laughs> all this data that I'm giving you is all from the USDA database. So the, sources, the source of the information is the source that all renal dietitians utilize. Yep. And one thing I forgot to mention earlier is we are going to do a book giveaway oh, for people you. who are watching this. I forgot. We're like an hour and 10 minutes into <laughs> yeah, exactly. it. Exactly. Oh no, James. <laughs> so for those that watch this long, woohoo! Here's what we're going to do. When we're done with the video, share it. Share it on social media, but you got to use the hashtag you know, hashtag 
Cooking for Your Kidneys, all one word. That is the title of the book. And you can share this as many times as you want. Every single share is an entry. And then, but you gotta use the hashtags. That's the only way I can see that you shared it, is that you shared it with that hashtag. I will then, this weekend, so you have the whole week to do this, share it on, on your, your Facebook group, share it in other places, wherever you got. And I will randomly select somebody and we are going to give away this book. All right, so I will be reaching out. You'll get an email or a message or something from me, depends on what platform you're on. I will reach out to you and I will say, hey, email me this. I'll send you, I send you like a code. Email me this back so I make sure you, know, you email me back and we get your address, we'll take care of that. We're also gonna have other giveaways throughout the week. Um, but this is an awesome, awesome book. Uh, I don't want to discourage anyone from ordering it, though. <laughs> Look, we just want to get the info out there, right, James? You know, we want to help people. <laughs> Here, we got someone say, too late, already bought it. <laughs> well, thank you, and I'm sorry, I guess. <laughs> just very happy that you bought it. Very, very happy yeah, for that. Very happy about that part. It is a great book. There's so much information. It's just not recipes. You're going to learn about the science. There's so much data in here. Um, and I have so many pages that are you know, folded over where there's something important. Oh, that's that barbecue sauce. Um, you can tell I love barbecue. You look through here. I don't have a lot of the plant-based things um, <laughs> booked over. Oh, Three Sisters, that one's plant-based. Yeah, there you is. go. Right. It is. That's another favorite of mine in there. Lots of great stuff in there. But we will be giving away um, to somebody who shares this. So share it with hashtag cooking for your kidneys all right okay let me scroll through the comments real quick and see if we have any questions that sure james might be able to to fit in right here let's see oh i love this and any of you who cannot find it like like ray here over in the uk hey ray tell your mom i said hi okay i hope she's doing better i know she's trying to get her hemoglobins up um and he had messaged me and she had that metallic taste. Oh, that's that's normal. Yeah, I hated that. It, it made me not want to eat anything. Uh, but if you can't get the book, visit or call up your local bookstores. Let's give them some business. You know, they're having tough, tough times right now with COVID. And let's remind them, hey, we've got some kidney patients. And who knows, the person you're talking to may have kidney disease or have a relative and not be aware of the book. And now you just made them aware of something that could make their life easier and better. So it's always good to do that. Oh, here's a question. Uh-oh. <laughs> Surprise is not from my dad, because <laughs> he's on here. <laughs> what about, whoops, wrong one, rabbit meat. Any thoughts on that? Rabbit. I don't remember seeing rabbit meat in here. I don't know if I put rabbit in there. I'm gonna look while we're talking about it, James. Maybe you can give me some kind of uh, you know background noise why I do that. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I will look through here, see what else is in here. And I love all the conversation you guys are having with each other. That is fantastic. The community is, it's just awesome how we support each other. Um, and we've done great so far, these last few broadcasts. None of those, uh, the bad people have gotten in here trying to push their pills or something like sure. that. I don't have any information on rabbit meat, uh, but I could find out. That one is easy. Uh, I will gladly look it up. I will forward it to James, and uh, maybe he'll find you. Yeah, and send I'll it throw in the notes yeah, in here. Absolutely. I'll give you the I'll give you the rundown. Um, but I, I don't even want to guess, just because I think uh, yep, it's probably closer. I, I actually, I don't even know. I don't know if it will be closer to a chicken or a beef, but or a turkey. You know. Yeah, and I know my relatives, rabbit, deer. Yeah, you know, we're in Ohio. They they like let the game meat. Yeah, they let off for school for deer season, opening deer season. And if you hit it with your car, it doesn't count. So it's like a bonus. <laughs> it's all good this is all great information because if I can, you know, eventually do my small revision, I can start adding game meats in there too. Yeah. Can... Right. Let's see. Um, so I've, I've seen a few questions about uh, fish and mercury levels. Anything you... That you sometimes depends on, on the that? water it comes from. You know, we, you and I both live sort of close to the Great Lakes, James, and mm -hmm. uh, there's. So my kids are. They're swimming in the Great Lakes right now. 
So we, we do have problems with that. And they even, your health department will be a really good resource for that. And you can get a hold of those, that online. And they can tell you what they recommend for the mercury levels, for how much you should be eating. Uh, and I'd like to probably talk to a doctor about that because I would imagine the filtering process of mercury is is also in part the kidneys, and that could do some damage as well. So uh, you want to be really I would I would imagine you're going to want want to be really careful with that. Yep, and I think we for the most part address so many of the questions. There's been a lot of comments. There's a lot to go through, <laughs> but this is fantastic. We have so many people that are happy. Um, well, I'm glad to hear that. I think we meet a lot of people very hungry and they're talking about stuff and I'm reading about it um, here, right here. Oh, this sounds so good. Roast beef. Mm. I, I don't eat roast beef so often cause it's so, I, I eat so much of it. It's so hard to control the pork. It's like watermelon. I can't have watermelon just because I grew up where my mom would get those gigantic long watermelons. We slice it open, you take a salt shaker, and it's pretty much like a salt shaker each, and you just coated it and ate it and spit out the seeds, and it was, I went through a whole watermelon. I had no problems with fiber. There was never any <laughs> constipation as right. a kid, right. ever. <laughs> but now just eating a little bit of portion of watermelon, I feel like I'm cheating myself without covering it in salt. I'm like, oh. Yeah, and dialysis patients worry about that a little because watermelon is mostly water, not just because of the name, but a lot of fruits are that way. So that adds to your water content. Um, yep. Oh, here's a good question. Is your book available, and I'm thinking it's not, as an audio book because there's so many it, charts. Right, it's not as an audio book, but it is available as a download. Kindle? Oh, yep. very it's, good. Uh, yeah, you can download it. Where? That's a good question. I don't think Amazon has it as a download, but a lot of the other um, online uh, resources do because I know I've sold books that way. Yep. And one last question. I've seen it in here a few times. When you cook beef and you do use spices, what's your favorite spices to use with beef? Well, you know, I will create uh, my own rub and if I'm going to use spices, it's going to be in that barbecue genre. And so I'm going to use either a wet version of that barbecue sauce that I have or a dry version, which is just to utilize as many of those chili spices as I can, along with garlic and onion, and then grind them up as my own rub. So I don't buy them when I cook meat. I usually am like you, James. I'm a purist. Uh, mm -hmm. But when I do it, it's going to be it's going to be my own rub, and then I'm going to create what I like based on those um, yep. pure ingredients, rather than a purchased one, which could have and almost always do enormous amounts of sodium. Yep. And here's something. Actually, this is a really good question that came up. Pork. We didn't talk about pork. The other we did white talk meat. About pork. Yeah. So pork in general has just a, has a little bit higher level of phosphorus. Um, often it has a little more fat too, depending on which cut you use. And again, all listed in the book, all the different parts of it. Yep. Uh, but it does have a little more phosphorus. And so the number of the phosphorus to protein is a little higher. It's not anywhere near beans. It's just higher than the, some of the other meats. So yep. you can use it. Um, be careful again, because uh, certain ones are, are high in sodium. You know, yep. that, that's always a big problem. So this is great. I mean, the big takeaway from today is portion control, which is the key to our diet. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, we can work in uh, animal protein, meat, seafood yeah. into our diet, um, better quality. And that's what we need to look for. Really, don't, it comes down to quality. Yeah, yeah don't be getting the, the cheap stuff that's inflated with water and stuff like that. You're just paying for that instead of what you really want to get. Um, I think that all sounds fantastic. And, you know, I've never been 100% vegetarian or 100% vegan. It's only for a little bit of time. <laughs> like, like my lunch today was 100%. Let's see. Yeah, it was vegan. I had a vegan lunch today. Right, so I was James. vegan for lunch. <laughs> and I'll be vegan for dinner. But let me tell you, tomorrow. Mmm. <laughs> Well, use yeah, some of the stuff we talked talk about. 
it's hard to talk about steaks if you're a meat eater and not immediately want one. I think sometimes that's a problem. You know? Yeah. Oh, and then I want to mention your website, cookingforyourkidneys.com. Oh, so never do that, Someone, James. You know that? I, I, forgot. I, I forget all this stuff. I got to make better <laughs> graphics and have all the good info on them. <laughs> Um, yeah, cookingforyourkidneys.com. You got your blog, all sorts of great information on there. Oh, and um, the, you can download those charts if you wanted to right from the website. I just put it up before we went on air. Yep. So you go there and just look for news and events. There's a one of the categories to click on is news and events. It'll be the first one that says, hey, you can download those uh, slides that we showed you. Uh, it's a PDF and then print them or just put them on your phone. And just in case when you go to the store, you forget. I mean, I don't know. Exactly. How many of you remember to look for air chill. Like, what was that? What was that thing about chicken? And, you know, what am I looking for? Is it good to have all that water bad? You know, but uh, um, it should be. It's all there. So you can download it from the website. Again, news and events is the is what to click on when you go there and uh, it'll be all set. Yep. And I do that. I grab stuff. I throw it on my phone. I take with me because then I always have it with me and I love that. All right, everybody. If you have not subscribed yet, it is free. Just go to YouTube, click that subscribe button. Let's get that number up to 100,000. If we get it to 100,000 subscribers, YouTube sends me a little tiny plaque with a silver play <laughs> button, which would be really cool to have because I've, I've got nothing from them and that would be awesome. Um, and I just, I just, I just want to hit that. I want to add it to my wall back here. The silver play button. Then we'll work going towards a million followers. Uh, <laughs> share this video, please. Let's help bring hope and inspiration and motivation to other people. And don't forget, use the hashtag pound cooking for your kidneys. All right? I call the hashtag a pound. I'm old school. I was born. <laughs> that's how we. That's hashtag. how we did it before James. Right? Exactly. That's what it originally was called. It was a pound. Use the hashtag cooking for your kidneys when you share it and. And I will randomly this Saturday reach out. I will find somebody, pick them, reach out to you. You will get a free copy of this book. You can share it as many times you want. Every time you share it with that hashtag is an entry because I goes through and it tells me here's all the shares that are out there. And I have a software program that sits there and it randomly picks someone. And then I reach out to you. And if I don't hear back from you in a day or so, I'll give you like two days. I go to the next person until we get a hold of someone. Say, yep, that's me. And boom, you're going to get a copy of this great book, Cooking for Your Kidneys. And if you don't win one, buy it. This should be in everyone's library. It is full of all sorts of information. All right, we have live shows the rest of the week. Tomorrow night, we have a nephrologist, one with more energy than me. Wow. And he's going to talk about kind of the problems and the challenges with working with your nephrologist. He's, he's on our side. He's one of us. He's going to share with us, hey, here's the challenges he has. Here's the problems he sees, how we can work better with our nephrologist. And, and what questions should you be asking your nephrologist? Then we got Jen on Tuesday. We're going to talk about your labs, how to understand them. She has a downloadable lab tracking sheet that you guys can download to help you track your labs and see the trends going in the right direction. After that, we have... Uh, the people from Pro Renal Plus D. We got a nephrologist who's on the board of Nephroceuticals, and I probably butchered the name. So sorry. Uh, long names are hard. Um, it's like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Um, we're going to have them. Then the next day, we have people from Renadil, or it might be vice versa. We've got representatives. I think we have, I think they have a, a nephrologist on the phone with us. I might have gotten them and and who they're having represent mixed up a little bit, but we're going to have them talking about gut health. Then on Friday, the last day of Kidney Health Week here on Dadvice TV, we have Sarah Better, who is a local um, amazing person running for office, but she's going to talk to us. It's not a political call or a political conversation, but it will be about politics, about health care and how we can get our voices heard as kidney patients to make sure that our needs are met with healthcare and the laws here in the US. And also I wanna ask her, um, what can we do to get phosphorus on the labels? And things like that, questions like that you guys can ask. She's an amazing woman, an amazing mom, a lawyer, 
um, has kids with disabilities, and she pretty much lived through the whole problem with health care and, and her kids not getting what they needed. Trouble getting them what they needed. And she pretty much said, you know what? Uh-uh, no more, I'm changes. Oh, and she used to work in the West Wing. Yeah, the White House for one of our past presidents. So she knows what she's talking about. We got Sarah Bitter here on Friday. So every day this week, the rest of the week, live shows as we promote kidney health and we all work to kick kidney disease to the curb. All right, everybody, thank you so much. I appreciate having you all here and I love all the comments. Have a great rest of the day and I will see you in the next video.